It's March 10th, 1801, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. So it was on this day that Britain carried out its first national census since the Doomsday Book. And unsurprisingly, it turned out plenty had changed in the (laughs) intervening 700 odd years. Not least that the population of Britain had grown tenfold in the intervening time. And they made quick work of putting this thing out. The census bill was presented to Parliament on the 20th of November 1800. It was passed on the 3rd of December and received royal assent on the 31st of December. In other words, they gave themselves two months to put this together before issuing it on this day of the 10th of March, which is absolutely mad, isn't it, when you compare it to what happens nowadays? where it takes years to formulate all the questions and set up the logistics of processing it all. And they had the (laughs) stats within a year, which is quicker than last year's one now. Like, we have to wait until May to get the results of the 2021 census, but they turned this one around within a year, and they didn't have the internet. I mean, part of the reason why they wanted to do it in such a hurry was because the impetus for doing it in the first place was the fact that Britain had been at war with France for most of the 1790s, which created this real need to know exactly how many eligible fighting men there were. It was also a time of quite bad harvests and there were food shortages and there were broad concerns that the population was going to soon outgrow food supplies and other resources. So basically they came up with this act and then they were like, right, we need results pretty much immediately. Throughout the 1700s, there'd been this gnawing concern about Britain's ability to feed itself. We're talking about, you know, the age of enlightenment. So this meant it was time to get scientific and crack the numbers. But there were no numbers to crack. There was no exact population data. And that was a subject of concern. And it was sort of kicked into overdrive towards the end of the 1700s. Uh, In 1798, Thomas Robert Malthus, who is the clergyman and economist, published his essay on the principle of population, which doesn't sound like a banger, but made a (laughs) terrific splash at the time. And he used mathematical principles to calculate what he thought the population was and where it was going. And he predicted that that would be accompanied by food shortages, that there would be mass unemployment because there wouldn't be enough jobs for all these people. But weirdly, at the same time, there was also alarm in the opposite direction, that people had been looking at the London baptism and death records, and and those parish records were the closest thing at the time to a census, and they appeared to show deaths outstripping births in the capital, which led some people to actually fear the population was in decline. So you had two completely opposite anxieties, and the only way to assuage them was by having a census. Mm. But Malthus's writing was pretty blunt. He, He issued conclusions that anyone could understand. I mean, I read his essay today, and For something that was written in 1798, I could follow it (laughs) quite easily. Uh, Population, when unchecked, he says, increases in a geometrical ratio. Subsistence increases only in an arithmetical ratio. A slight acquaintance with numbers will show the immensity of the first power in comparison to the second. Hmm. So he's sort of like Farage-like, basically, turns into a very straightforward conclusion. Wait, 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 wait. you keep saying straightforward, Ollie. What is the geometrical? Is he saying that, like, one person might have four kids, but one wheat will only have one wheat? Yeah, he puts it even more bluntly than this at one point. He's like, let's take two things as a given. One is that a field can only have so much grain, and the other is that the passion between the sexes will not die between generations. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what it comes down to. Big it's just, down. you know, people going to keep banging, yeah. but the food is not going to keep coming. Another aspect of why it's astonishing how quickly they turned it around is the fact that they used this army of clerks who had only pens and paper at their disposal. Uh, but what made it easier, perhaps, is that the first census was just a head count with almost no personal information. Yeah, I mean, the individual householder would not be invited to to directly take part in the census until 1841. The first four censuses were all carried out by local officials and enumerators. And in Scotland, they actually used schoolmasters. They would be given the task to provide overall data for their area, but very few details. It kind of reminds me of um, when you have, um, you know, modern anonymized data. The, the goal was about drawing these big pitch conclusions about what the population looked like. So the only information you would get for each area was the number of males and females in that area and the number who were engaged in various occupations like such as you know agriculture industry and they weren't actually required to provide names or any other individual data although some jobsworth enumerators went above and beyond and did collect that data for their own local records and those unofficial documents are the ones that you can still search now if you are looking for your family ancestry 
But the flip side of that is that a lot of people didn't. There was no real oversight. Some parishes just didn't do it properly. And some never bothered returning the paperwork at all. So it wasn't accurate. Although, it's interesting, it did pretty much show that the total population for England and Wales was what people thought it was. <laughs> uh, it came out as 8.87 million. They're like, guys, we should have trusted our guts. <laughs> <laughs> so some parts of the country didn't record or report their results and uh, the number that they settled on was pretty close to what they reckoned anyway. Do you, th- do you think they were just like, oh, <laughs> we didn't do a good job. Let's just put an, a figure to this. <laughs> yeah, the fact that some parishes hadn't completed their census requirements successfully was actually laid out in quite critical terms in the volumes that were eventually published by the parliamentary printer, Luke Hansard. I didn't realise that that was where Ah, the name came from. Subject of a future episode, (laughs) we think. (laughs) They decided to carry on with it. You know, Britain has had a census every 10 years since, except during World War II. And the earliest ones didn't take a lot of individual data. You know, they were following the tradition of the earliest forms of census we have from ancient times were for taxation purposes rather than having any demographic interests whatsoever. But slowly these other elements started to be introduced. So ages were first included in 1821. In 1831, they introduced occupational data. And then finally, in 1841 was when we had the birth of the modern census. And that's, this is the earliest one that you can still so you know, sort of browse online on family history websites, where householders were individually polled. But there was, an, there was still the enumerator who would come and collect the forms, and they could actually assist the large number of illiterate families if needed. Mm. And also, it was the first one where birthplace was included, which is a, you know, a sign that's a society had become more mobile and that the government was interested in in tracking those movements. Well, the census came to kind of reflect the concerns of its era. For example, the 1951 census encouraged women to be honest about their ages, presumably because they were concerned that previously women were lying. Yeah, the honesty thing is so interesting, isn't it? Mm. I struggled with this myself on the subject of religion. Right. Because I am not religious. I do not believe in God. If there's been any generational shift in my lifetime that would be recorded on the census, it's that I, having come from a Jewish family, would now actually honestly decree myself of, as having no religion whatsoever. Yeah. But I ticked Jewish. And the reason I ticked Jewish was because I thought, well, I know the government are going to use this to like, create services to support people. I don't want them withdrawing, like, you know kosher meals at state schools because I didn't tick the box. Yeah. I am part of a community that I want them to support. So you have this dichotomy in yourself where you're like i know the government are using this for different purposes than future historians which one am i supposed to be talking to well religion famously became one of those uh questions where people decided this was a point where they didn't have to be as honest as they were being in in their answers in other categories and in 2001 400,000 people claimed that their religion was jedi which was just shy of one percent of the population at the time well in the was it the 1911 census where all the suffragettes said that that was their occupation yeah that's quite an effective protest technique isn't it (laughs) there's actually some suggestion that 2021 could be the last census ever taken and the uk's national statistician professor sir ian diamond said that basically now we can get the same result out of gp lists and council tax records and driving license details and so on and that would be a much quicker and cheaper way of doing it in future so it could be that actually censuses are on their way out I don't believe it, because all that information has been readily available through social media for the last 10 years anyway, hasn't it? I (laughs) think it's just that you want a comparable document with the one from 1801 in some sense, don't you? You want that continuum of history. That maybe the future will just be our Amazon and Google and Facebook data. It's not as romantic for future genealogists, is it? Looking into your family history and being like, (laughs) oh, look, in 2022, my great great uncle was registered at a GP surgery in Rotherhithe. And why did he go to so many lame parties in 2011 documented in glorious (laughs) photographic detail on Facebook? (laughs) And why did he buy that top loader CD? (laughs) Tomorrow. The final bit is sort of moral message with a cop lecturing someone to, you know, stay off drugs or whatever it is. Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.